find out you'll find out next next three units that, that anatomy to me is fun, but physiology is fun. so when you look at when you look at hospitals and you look at how people get go from being reasonably stable and healthy to dead in a very short period of time. It's usually not the digestive system that we discovered, but usually kidney, respiratory, and cardiovascular are the next two units that we're going to cover. So in this unit, I'm giving you homework. In the next unit, you're getting the homework. Also, because it, again, it, it puts together for you, hopefully, things that you need to understand in a hospital setting that, that take people from being reasonably healthy to near death in very short periods of time. Right? So they need to be paid attention to. So any questions about that? So today in, in, uh, in lab we're going to go through the anatomy of the urinary system and it's fairly easy to go through fairly quick. So I'm going to go over it quickly as we go through. Uh, the people in lab one have already gone through it. <coughs> lab two will go through it again more slow. And so I'm going to uh, get to the physiology more quickly so we have more time to go through that. Uh, so today and tomorrow we're going to kind of do lecture one, which is the physiology. Try to finish it part way through tomorrow. Start with the respiratory tomorrow. Finish it on Thursday, and then do kind of a, a, the third lecture, which integrates some of that on how the kidney and lungs work together uh, next Tuesday. All right. And then it's kind of fun labs because we do one anatomy and one physiology. So the other homework you have is I'm giving you a little cup to take with you uh, today in lab. And tomorrow you bring that full of urine. And then we'll actually do urine analysis in lab tomorrow. Okay. And so you're going to do your own, and I'm going to supply you with a couple of unknowns to see if we can then begin to, to use what's going on with the kidney in a clinical setting to figure out what's going on with someone. Okay. So the reason why we have a urinary system, it's the easiest homework you ever have. <laughs> Just be in a cup. Turn this out. So, so uh, the reason why we have kidneys is to obviously make urine. And it's one of the few places in our body where filtration really occurs. So we commonly think of the liver as a filter. But the liver doesn't filter in the sense that you're pushing fluid through a structure. The kidney has cells that process fluid, but not in the sense of a true filter. Kind of like the filter in your coffee pot, where you allow the fluid to pass through a filter so that what's in the collection is different than what was in the filter. And that's what's going on in the kidney as well. So the, the reason for making urine is to help regulate blood ionic composition. So when we think about the relationship between our blood and our tissues, then, then what we have actually is a blood vessel with a lumen. And the blood vessel contains what we call blood plasma. And at capillary beds, we exchange material with our blood. And then at capillary beds, we have cells. And the fluid in cells, we say, is intracellular fluid. And then the stuff in between is interstitial fluid or ion. And what we have to do is we have to try to maintain a relationship between all of these. But what we do is we try to maintain certain ions <coughs> in blood at higher concentrations. And then we try to maintain other ions in higher concentrations inside a cell. Right? And then, 
So one of the things that kidney does is help us regulate that relationship. So control ion composition of blood. Now, if you remember, if we use the word osmosis, what's the classic definition of osmosis? Diffusion between. Movement of something. Movement of something through a selectively permeating membrane. So what's moving? Water. So osmosis is a movement of water. All right. So what the kidney helps us do is maintain blood osmolarity. So the word osmolarity is related to the word osmosis. So the other thing we have to worry about in here is when we're thinking about the blood, we have this stuff dissolved solutes over the fluid in the blood, the plasma, that we call solvents. And we have to worry about that relationship in all three tissue layers, in all three of these fluids. Okay. And ideally, we want to maintain the same level of solvents to solutes in all three. And then we're in what we would say is a isotonic state, right? And in an isotonic state, fluid moves in both directions, but we have no gain in fluid, right? So if we change blood osmolarity, so if we increase the solutes, <coughs> so if we increase blood osmolarity, we would increase the solutes. So now there's more solutes in the blood, so what direction is water going to flow? Yeah. Towards the blood, right? So then we're going to dehydrate our cells and put all that fluid in our blood, and our blood pressure will go away which creates problems clinically, right? So what the kidney wants to do is try to maintain that osmotic relationship between the blood and your intracellular fluid or interstitial fluid and your cells. And if we move water in either direction, it creates a significant problem. So there was a woman in California that responded to an ad uh, and a radio station had this contest to win a, a, one of the 3B players to put on your computer. And the contest was the person who drank the most water in the shortest period of time would win the contest. She drank five gallons in 20 minutes and died. Because the kidney could not maintain blood osmolarity at a fast enough rate. So when she was adding water to her blood, the blood osmolarity was dropping. All the fluid then was beginning to exit the blood and go into her brain cells, and her brain cells started swelling and swelling and swelling and swelling and swelling. And, swelling. and she complained of severe headaches before she left, which was classic to that edema that was occurring in her brain. So what we want to do is maintain homeostasis, and what we don't want to do is get into a position where we're moving fluid in large volumes. <coughs> So regulation of blood volume, well those two go hand in hand. If you can regulate blood osmolarity, then you can regulate blood volume. So what we want to do is not change blood osmolarity so that we either dehydrate our blood, move water into our cells, and so in that instance the blood would become hypotonic to your cells, and then fluid would travel toward your cells, which what, hap what happened with her in that scenario. If you were in a desert and you hadn't been able to drink for five or six days, then your blood would become very viscous and hypertonic. Then you'd start dehydrating all your cells and moving blood fluid into your blood. So what we want to do is maintain an isotonic situation so that our fluid in our blood isn't changing appreciably and our fluid in our cells isn't changing appreciably. All right. So uh, the one thing we're going to see is there's always a direct relationship between blood volume and blood pressure. So you can think of the cardiovascular system as a tube, and the tube has a given amount of pressure on the inside of it. And when we measure pressure, we're measuring the pressure against the wall of the tube. So that's the way a pressure cuff works. You compress an artery in your arm, you stop blood flow in the arm, which is why when you're first learning to do blood pressures, people's fingers go blue, their hands begin to tingle if you're too long doing it, because you've actually shut off blood flow to the hand using the pressure cuff. And then when you release the pressure, 
you get turbulence when blood begins to flow back through the blood vessel. So essentially what you're doing with the pressure cuff is collapsing the, the artery. And then as you release the pressure in the cuff and blood first begins to flow, it will vortex after this restriction. And this is the sound you're actually hearing when you're taking a blood pressure is that vortex in the blood, the turbulence in the blood. And you hear it as a swishing sound when, you, when you're listening for it. And then we determine systolic blood pressure where blood first flows. And we determine diastolic blood pressure by the time the pressure is no longer restricting blood flow. <coughs> so the first sound you hear, the last sound you hear, and that's the parameters for blood pressure. Well, what happens is we're actually measuring the force against the wall of the blood pressure, blood vessel. So as, as, so as blood pressure goes up, the force on the vessel wall goes up. So what used to happen 30, 40 years ago is people would get high blood pressure. We had poor medicines at controlling blood pressure. And people would have strokes in their late 60s, early 70s, and die from strokes. We've now moved that out to the 80s and 90s because we've learned to control blood pressure. So people are living longer because they aren't impacted by, by pressure system. So by the kidney controlling the amount of fluid in your blood, then it can control the amount of pressure <coughs> against the vessel wall. Right? So these three, two, three, and four, all are, are directly related to one another. What changes the amount of fluid in your blood is osmolarity. As we drive volume up, pressure goes up. As you lose volume, pressure goes down. So if you came on the scene of a car accident, and there's an enormous pool of blood on the concrete, and you're trying to feel someone's pulse, and it's like, I can't, I, I'm having trouble feeling this pulse. Why? Because their volume is no longer inside them, it's outside them. So their blood volume went down, their blood pressure went down. And you're going to have trouble finding a pulse in a radial pulse. So you'd have to do a carotid pulse. Is this closer to the heart? Yes. All right. And then the last thing is the regulation of blood pH. So, so remember that the whole pH scale is based upon the properties of water, where water likes to dissociate and form hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. And so, ideally, if that's occurring at a given rate, then we would say that it's a neutral solution. So a neutral solution would be pH 7. And what we're essentially saying is that at pH 7, we have the same amount of these as we have the these. So both of them would be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. And then the pH value 7 is the negative log of the exponent. That's where the pH value comes from. So if something's acidic, then the amount of hydrogen ions go up. So in an acidic solution, we could go to 1.0 times 10 to the minus first. That would be a pH of 1. So this would then decrease. So this would be... 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. So they, they inverse one. So anything that adds hydrogen ions makes it more acidic. Anything that adds uh, hydroxyl ions would make it more basic. So if you look at Drano at home, and you look at the, added, the ingredient in most Drano, it's sodium hydroxide. So it adds a bunch of this stuff, very basic. Very toxic. Okay? All right. So, long story short, with blood pH, is your blood wants to stay between those values. And if you're outside those values, then you're in trouble. So, the regulation of blood pH then becomes critical because you don't want much shift in, in blood pH. 
So if you're if you're more acidic than this, let's say 6.9, then what the kidney's going to do is dump hydrogen ions in your urine so that your urine becomes acidic. So in a clinical setting, we collect urine and we test the pH of your urine because it tells us what's going on with hydrogen ions. And if, you're, if your urine is highly acidic, it means that you've got a lot of hydrogen ions in your blood. And that is, in fact, why the kidney is dumping hydrogen ions in the blood. So what's fascinating is this is what we like to maintain our, our urine pH. I mean our blood pH. So this is blood pH. If we look at urine pH, then we actually uh, would go to a pH of 4 that would be normal and to a pH of 8 that would be normal. So we have a much broader, <coughs> much broader range of what we would clinically think is normal. And that's the way we can adjust this blood pH, is a kidney can actually remove hydrogen ions or retain hydrogen ions, what it needs to do. And so we learned something from someone's urine about the pH of their blood by looking at it. So if you wanted to demonstrate that, um, so one thing you could do would be to drink a bunch of like cranberry juice or something before you urinate to collect your urine. And cranberry juice is acidic as you absorb it, you absorb hydrogen ions, makes a slight shift in blood pH, and then you dump the hydrogen ions in your urine to get rid of them. And so if somebody has, has recently drank a bunch of really acidic stuff, uh, soda pop or, or, or fruit juice that's real acidic, like, like uh, cranberry juice, then it tends to push their urine toward being acidic as well. So if you want to drink a whole bunch more cranberry juice, wine and beer would do the same thing. All right. So the other thing that our kidney does is it activates vitamin D. So vitamin D, remember, is produced in your skin. And the active form of vitamin D is a compound called calcitrol. And calcitrol is fundamentally important to calcium uh, homeostasis. So what <coughs> happens is calcitrol, uh, as it elevates, causes kidney cells to take up more calcium. So you don't dump as much calcium in your urine and you retain it. So calcitrol is very important to how the kidney works, allowing you to, to lose less calcium through urination. So one of the things with, with high protein diets, low carbohydrate diets, is that if the protein is coming from particularly red meat, like steaks and stuff, then it makes you lose a lot of calcium in your urine relative to to somebody who's got a more normal diet. And so those, those high protein diets can actually push you toward calcium deficiencies if you're not careful with it. Uh, all right. And then well, the only thing I'm going to do is mention it now, and then we're going to talk about how it works in the next unit. But the kidney and profusion in kidney cells is critically important. So kidney cells are high users of O2. Uh, to do their job because uh, they do a lot of active transport and active transport requires <coughs> ATP and the easiest way to make ATP is if we can use the Krebs cycle in the electron transport system so we need oxygen right so the kidney is a high user of O2 so a profusion of the kidney with O2 becomes critical and if the kidney drops in O2 production and the ability in O2 availability to it, it releases a hormone called urethropoietin. And urethropoietin stimulates bone marrow to make more red blood cells and to make more hemoglobin. And so the kidney itself tries to auto adjust your body to being able to carry more O2 by stimulating more red blood cell formation. So it's kind of a cool connection to that. And we'll talk about how it works and everything in the next unit when we deal with blood. Uh, but for example, people on chemotherapy that become anemic 
one of the things they can do is use urethropoietin to drive red blood cell formation in those. Athletes for a number of years have been using urethropoietin to drive blood cell formation. Then they get caught taking these drugs that they aren't supposed to, like in the Tour de France and stuff, because they've been doping. And that's one of the classic dopers is the drive blood cells up, so you have more oxygen in it. So, and then the other thing the kidney can do is it can help regulate blood glucose, but it primarily does it by gluconeogenesis, so it's doing it now. By taking blood and converting it to non-sugars, to sugars. So this is really a cool, this is really a cool mechanism in your body. Is that when skeletal muscle becomes anaerobic, uh, it makes lactic acid. Lactic acid circulates to the kidney, and the kidney can take gluconeogenesis and convert lactic acid to glucose. <laughs> so it can take a byproduct from muscle physiology and help stabilize blood sugar levels. With it. So it's really kind of a cool process. And then the last thing is what we typically think of what the kidney does, which is excrete waste products in our urine. <coughs> but believe me, that's a very critical thing because if you have complete kidney failure, you aren't going to live three weeks from the toxicity that builds up in your blood. But its other roles are critically important as well, but not just the secretion of uh, foreign substances. Anyway, so don't worry, we're not going to do any drug testing tomorrow in the US. So we won't be looking for those foreign substances. <laughs> so the way your body works is by signaling. So we make hormones to signal other cells to, to do things. But we can't retain hormones in our blood for long periods of time, or we have no way of communicating. So the kidney commonly dumps hormones out of your blood all the time. So if you're a woman and you're taking birth control pills, the reason why you have to take them every morning is because the kidney is dumping those hormones all day long. So they did an experiment where there are fish that can change sex, they can change gender. So male fish, fish can become female fish, and female fish can become male fish, depending upon the population of fish. So if there are too many females in the population, then a few females can convert to males. And, and so the reproductive state of the population can continue. So humans can't do that as effectively. So, um, so what they did is they took a bunch of male fish, of uh, these fish that can change gender, and they put them in a cage where sewage effluent was coming out of a major metropolitan area like Spokane, down here on the Spokane River just below us and the fish all became female. And the reason was there was so much estrogen in the stuff coming out of this retrieval plant from all the women taking birth control pills <laughs> that there was enough estrogen to trigger the fish into converting the females. So one of the things we do with getting rid of waste products is they're not only stuff we have taken in, but it's stuff your body makes as well. So we can actually we can actually determine ovulation of a woman with ovulatory kits based upon hormones that are being uh, removed from the blood in urine. We can determine whether a woman is pregnant by looking at hormones that are being returned that are being excreted from the blood via your kidney. So it plays in roles not only for internal substances but external substances. So the kidney itself is against your back abdominal wall. And it sets retroperitoneal, which means it's not in your peritoneal cavity, but it actually is in a little sac behind your peritoneal cavity. So we do kidney surgery, it does no good to enter your peritoneal cavity. So it's always got a posterior because it's actually setting in a little cushion. So this is a cadaver picture of the kidneys. And to allow you to take, see the kidneys, they had to remove the, the, the parietal peritoneum that was in front of it. So you get this nice clear view. When you first look at it, you, it would be covered with a membrane so that you really couldn't see the kidneys, which would be the parietal peritoneum. So because the kidneys sit against the posterior wall, and we have two short ribs to help protect them, rib 11 and 12, which both those ribs, you remember, have no connection to the interior. So they are floating ribs. And then we also cushion it. 
So we have kind of three layers that surround the kidney itself. Uh, so we have a renal fascia, which is the outermost layer. Then we, we put a bunch of adipose tissue, uh, which is called the adipose <coughs> tissue, between them. And so that's what's been removed off the picture over here, is the renal fascia to the outside, and all the fat has been removed, so you can actually see the kidney really well. And then because the kidney is not in the peritoneal cavity, it's not covered by visceral peritoneum, which is what the small intestine, large intestine, stomach was in the last one. So the renal, the, the, what covers the kidney is a renal capsule. So this layer right here is the renal capsule that's covering the kidney. So the renal capsule is a shiny surface on the kidneys you're seeing over there in that picture. So we use the cushioning to protect the, the kidney. So there are some uh, sporting exercises, uh, football being one where kidneys can become damaged fairly easy from impacts, and then the cage fighting phenomenon, which can you. Uh, you can actually get lacerated kidneys because they get pushed against the ribs and bleed. So the tube that drains urine from our bladder is a urethra. In women, it's only about an inch long. And that's why women typically get more urinary tract infections than men, because the bladder is really, the, really close to the surface, and the urethra is really straight and very short. So from a clinical standpoint, you'll figure that out if you're going into nursing where you have to catheterize patients and run a tube through the urethra up into the bladder. Women, it's very short and easy to get to. Men, it's a little more circuitous, and so they're a little harder to, to catheterize. All right. So with women, we don't subdivide it because the urethra is really short. But in men, we, we have to subdivide it uh, based upon what the urethra is passing through. <coughs> so the, there's a little gland that says just below the bladder in men, which is called the prostate gland. So the prostate gland is involved in producing semen. We'll go into detail in the last unit on, on, on how it does that. But <coughs> the urethra passes through the prostate gland. So the, the urethra that passes through the prostate gland is called the prostatic urethra to indicate that it's passing through the prostate gland. Then as men age, the prostate gland can enlarge and then they can't pee. <laughs> and so there's a drug that men take that women should take called Flomax. And Flomax is active on the prostate and decreases the swelling in the prostate so they can pee better. And then if they can't pee, then you have to go in and, and actually physically uh, increase the opening through the prostate in, in a process called a transurethral resection, where they go in and open up the prostate gland so, so men can pee as well. So an elderly man, sometimes they, they just dribble and they can't really pee and it's because the prostate gland gets swollen. So, so my, my stepfather takes Flomax and every once in a while my mom will take his medicines. So it's like, well, what's the Flomax going to do? <laughs> so the next thing that happens is we have a band of muscle that keeps all our organs from falling out between our legs. It also acts as an external urethral sphincter to allow us to control urination. So the band of muscle has a generic name called the urogenital diaphragm. And the part of the urethra that passes through the urogenital di diaphragm is called the membranous urethra. So prostatic urethra first, membranous urethra. And then from there, the urethra passes into a structure called the bulb of the penis which is actually behind the man's scrotum, uh, uh, back toward the man's anus, there's an there's a erectile tissue that sits back in there. So uh, it's one of the ways in which uh, erectile dysfunction occur because there are important nerves that pass into that. So one of the population of men that has uh, unusual erectile dysfunction at an early age are extreme mountain bikers because the seat puts all of the, their weight on the ball of the penis. Then when they're pounding on the rocks and stuff, it's, 
it actually causes nerve damage. So there are now 21, 22 year old guys with erectile dysfunction because of nerve damage that occurs uh, to that, to the bulb of the penis because of that. So but what happens is the urethra enters the bulb of the penis and then travels through the penis. And so it's usually called the penile urethra because it's in the penis. But it's also surrounded by some, some uh, uh, erectile tissue that's called the corpus spongiosum. So it, it, it forms the bulb of the penis, holds the, penis, the urethra into the glands penis. So some people call it the spongy urethra because it's associated with this spongiosum, <coughs> the erectile tissue. So it actually has two names, penile or spongy urethra. It's been, so, so it's kind of interesting. If you can't pee, then you go see a urologist who's a specialist in these tubes, the urethra and the bladder. So if women get bladder infections, frequently they go see a urologist. The men can't pee because their prostate is, is swelling, they go see a urologist. So I always thought it was kind of funny. But especially in this medicine, it's all for your nation. Right. So the structure in a kidney that allows you to make urine is called a nephron. So therefore, if you are having trouble making urine, you go see a nephrologist. So a nephrologist is the specialist in the, the formation of urine. So usually people that are being a kidney failure, then you, you end up go seeing a nephrologist or if you have congenital kidney disease or something like that. So the functional unit in our kidney is a nephron. And the nephron is what filters the blood, processes the urine flows. So we have two types of nephrons in our kidney. Cortical nephrons, which are the most common, 80 to 85%. And what we can do with an organ, remember, is if the organ internally is structured different than externally, then what we can do is we call the outer part of the organ the cortex, and we call the inner part of the organ the medulla, because there's structural and functional differences in the, in a kidney that's going to be structural and functional. Right? So cortical nephrons get their name because they're mostly in the cortex. So on this picture, this line is the junction between the renal cortex and the renal medulla. So notice that almost most of this nephron is above the dashed line, meaning that most of the nephron is out here in this area and not dropping into this area very far. Now, what happens is that the further the nephron drops into the medulla, the more concentrated you can make your urine. So we have 80% of our nephrons that are really short nephrons, cortical nephrons. And then we have juxtamedullary nephrons, so here's medulla in the word, 15 to 20% that produce the most concentrated urine. So we are not very desert adapted animals, so we have to drink water a lot to maintain homeostasis and health. And if we get dehydrated, we get into trouble fairly, fairly quickly. So I used to do this experiment, so it was part of the lab you're doing where we did urine analysis. But I would give the students in groups kangaroo rats, and it was because it was about a six hour drive on a weekend to go down and catch some kangaroo rats out in the desert. And then I would, they were, it was always fun. They had to capitalize the little kangaroo rats. And then they had to collect urine for 24 hours <coughs> and measure the volume of urine that the kangaroo rat was producing. And when we had white lab rats, we did the same thing. So each group of students got a white, blood, a white lab rat and then a kangaroo rat. Well, what they would see is if they had all the water they wanted to drink, the white rat, white rat was producing three to four times the volume of urine that the kangaroo rat. Even though they could drink it, they had water all they did. So the first 24 hours, they had constant water whenever they wanted, they had a source of water. In the next 24 hours, they had no water. And so at the end of that 24 hours, the white rat was still producing two to three times the volume of urine that the kangaroo rat was producing. 
who was beginning to show clinical signs of dehydration. Kangaroo rat was happy as heck and produced an almost syrupy urine. And that's because they have many more juxtapedular nephrons. Yeah. All right. So in a cortical nephron, most of it, most of the nephrons in the cortex. And in a juxtapedular nephron, most of the nephron uh, and the critical piece of the nephron, the loop of hemolydian, it drops, drops way down into the medulla. And that allows you to concentrate urine uh, to a greater extent. And there are some ethnic differences in kidneys. If you're a Bedouin who's lived in the desert for centuries with very little water supply, yeah, pretty interesting. So what a nephron does, which is what we're seeing up here, is it is what filters the blood and makes the urine. So then what we need is a collection system to collect the urine so that we can move it out of our kidney into our bladder and eventually out of our bladder in, uh, through the urethra. And so the medulla is subdivided into these pyramidal shaped things called renal pyramids. So we have renal pyramids in our renal medulla. And this is where we concentrate our urine in these triangular shaped things that are called pyramids. Notice that all the triangular th shaped things are pointing toward the center of, of the kidney. So that they're broader toward the cortex and they come to a point as they get toward the center. Now, that point's called that papilla. So the point of each pyramid, so the point of each pyramid is a renal papilla. And so what the papillae do is they come to a point, so all the tubes coalesce to a fine point, and then urine constantly drips out of the pyramids. So then what actually happens is we get urine dripping out of pyramids all the time. So we have to have a collection system that's going to collect this urine. And so the first two things are called calyces, or a calyx. And so notice that we have a minor calyx and a major calyx. So the way the calyx actually <coughs> works is that each pyramid, each pyramid has its own relationship to a calyx. So we have this pyramid going down, and then the papilla fits in the end of it, fits in this little like funnel-shaped thing that is a minor calyx. And then the minor calyces drain all the urine out of that. So what we have then is we have pyramids associated with, with each minor calyx. So you can think of the minor calyx as a small funnel. And then two small funnels come together to form a bigger funnel. So this is minor, and this is major. So we have a minor calyx, one per pyramid, and then several minor calyx come together to form a major calyx. And then all of the minor calyxes and major calyxes, eventually, when we look at it, all come together to form a big area called the pelvis. So urine would first enter a minor calyx, and go to a major calyx, and from a major calyx to the pelvis. So you can think of it as a large funnel, medium-sized funnel, and a giant funnel for the kidney itself. So here's a minor calyx, minor, 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 all coming together to form a major. And the major comes into this, which is the renal pelvis. And then the renal pelvis all drains into a <coughs> urethra. So we have a tube from each kidney that goes to our bladder that's called a ureter. And we're constantly making urine 24-7 in our kidney. And what allows us to be able to walk around and not dribble urine every place we go is the fact that we have a bladder that will store it for us. All right. Otherwise, we would just dribble urine everywhere we went because we make it 24 hours a day. 
five days a year. And then if we sat for a while, we would get a pool of urine where we were sitting, and then we'd get up and move around on So, So that's what happens when people become incontinent. So I just think these things you learn and you just look. So if you go to a clinic like a nephrologist where they're mostly just elderly people that are going, and you look at the chairs and the there's always these little stains that you turn over the chair. There's a lot of incontinent people who go there. <laughs> So then what happens is the ureter goes to our urinary bladder. And then if we're male, we have a urethra we subdivide into three parts. If we're female, we just we, we just have a urethra. So a prostatic membrane is a female urethra. It's kind of our, our tube system for draining urine. All right. So the other thing we have to do is we have to get blood supply into our kidney because we're going to process blood. So the glomerulus is a capillary bed. The peritubular capillaries are a capillary bed. So why do we call it like in the liver if we have two capillaries connected? To it? It's a portal system. The one in the liver was a venual portal system where we had artery, capillary, vein, capillary, vein. This is an arterial portal system where we have an arterial leading to capillary a arterial draining a capillary and leading to a second capillary. So this is an arterial portal system where instead of having a vein here, we have an artery. Right? So our goal is to filter the blood, process the filter, have a second capillary bed to recollect things we want to keep. So that's why we reconnect them. So the glomerular capillary is where we filter blood. The peritubular capillaries are where we recollect things our body wants to keep. For example, like water, sugar, amino acids, things that we don't want to lose in our urine because we want to retain it. So we have to have two capillary <coughs> beds. One that acts as the filter, and then one that allows us to recollect things that we don't want to lose from our filter system. Other than that, it's a symmetric event where we start with a renal artery that brings blood to the kidney, and we have a renal vein that drains the kidney, sitting next to each other. So kind of at the extremes, we have a renal artery and a renal vein. And then the subdivisions are common. So the first branches off the renal artery are segmental arteries. And then the branches off segmental arteries are interlobar arteries. So what we're going to see again is what we saw in the liver, where we have a organ, and we can divide the organ into subunits that we call a lobe, and then we divide lobes into lobules. So we're going to do the same thing with the liver, with the kidney, where we can divide the kidney into lobes and lobules. Right? So, so a minor calyx, a pyramid, and its associated cortex is a lobe. And then a subdivision in this is going to become a lobe. All right. So these, these are all lobes. And in some animals, you can actually see the lobes of the kidney uh, when you take the kidney out. They're, they're, they're really subdivided, where ours are not. So, so it depends upon the the way the kidney is constructed uh, on that. So what happens then is the subdivisions of the segmental are interlobular because they are going to lobes. <laughs> so, so what we end up with is an interlobar, excuse me, an interlobar artery and an interlobar vein because they're leading to and draining lobes. Now, what happens, which is really kind of cool, is that we have this structure called a pyramid. And we have pyramids together. And so the space in between is called a column. So interlobar are found in the column. So these interlobar are in columns. When they get to columns, what, so the cortex, 
they will arc across the front. So we have a blood vessel that actually arcs across the top of this pyramid. So since they're crossing the top in an arc, then they're called arcuate arteries. So an arcuate artery and an arcuate vein. So those are all mirror images of one another. So then this is an arcuate artery, this is an arcuate vein, going across the top of a pyramid. And then little blood vessels that come off the arcuates and go up into the, into the cortex are called interlobular arteries. And so this would be an interlobular artery, this would be an interlobular vein. So they're actually taking blood out into the cortex. So that's the common pattern, mirror image. Arteries are called arteries because they're carrying blood from the heart to the organ. Veins are called veins because they're draining the organ back toward the heart. So the interlobulars, so the interlobulars are what are going to feed a lobe, which is essentially a, a lobule, excuse me, which is essentially a nephron. Okay. <coughs> So what we have then is we have a little tiny blood vessel that leads to the capillary bed. So it's called an arterial, <coughs> it's afferent, because it's leading to the capillary bed. Then we have a, a little tiny artery that drains this capillary bed, so it's called an efferent arterial. So A is toward, efferent is away, the reference is the glomerulus. Right. So if, I, if we kind of take a, a nephron and and kind of look at that, and here's the glomerulus. That's where we're going to filter our blood. So the blood vessel that leads to it is an afferent arterial. The blood vessel that drains this is a efferent arterial. And the next place it's going to go is to a second capillary vein, called a peritubular capillary. So what we're going to do in our glomerulus is we're going to filter fluid out of the blood. So we're actually going to take some of the blood volume and transfer it from inside the blood vessel to this space. So what did we say if blood volume drops, blood pressure will drop? So the way to avoid that is to decrease the size of your blood vessel. And then you can maintain pressure. I figured this out when I was putting my sprinkler system in. I thought, oh, I can do this. And then I did it, and then the sprinkler out there dribbled. <coughs> so it was too far away. So I had to go back and replace all that tube with a smaller tube to keep the pressure up. So because we've lost volume, the efferent arterial always has to be smaller than the afferent arterial so that we can maintain pressure. So on a model, you can always tell, even if you can't see anything else, the difference between an afferent and an efferent because of the diameter of the vessel. All right, so then what happens, if we go back to this picture now, is we have our afferent arterial coming off of our interlobular, here's the arcuates, and then it goes through this capillary band, and the efferent arterial leads to this capillary band, so that what happens is our filtrate that we're going to process is inside of these tubes. And stuff we want to keep, like water and sugar, is exiting the tube and getting picked up in our blood again by these peritubular capillaries. Okay. So peri around, what are they around? Tubules, peritubular capillaries. Now, on juxtamedullary nephrons, we have a really special peritubular capillary along the really long loop of Henley, and so it's called a vasorectum. So notice on this slide, if you compare the two types of, of nephrons, notice on this slide, they're just labeled peritubular capillaries, and there's no vasorectum, because we don't have that really long loop of Henley on a cortical nephron. When we get to a juxtamedullary nephron, now we still have a peritubular capillary up in the cortex, but this this capillary band is associated with this really long loop of him. It's called a vasorecta. So the take home message, vasorecta are associated with Jackson Mandular and Apple.
Okay. So now, what do nephrons do for us? They, they're essentially involved in three processes. They actually filter. So we have glomerular filtration that's occurring. They actually reabsorb things that we want to retain. So they do tubular reabsorption. And then they also put things in our urine that we want to get rid of, like those hormones or the breakdown products of, of drugs. And so paratubular secretion. So this is kind of interesting if you just look at urine. There's a, uh, there's a compound in asparagus that you have to have an enzyme to break down. And if you have a defect for that enzyme, then you don't break it down. The kidney takes that compound out of your blood, puts it in your urine. Then your urine smells really strong in asparagus after you've eat, you eaten asparagus. And so that's why some people's urine really stinks after you eat asparagus. Other people's urine. So there's also a pigment in beets that we have to have a enzyme to break down. Some people have a gene mutation for that enzyme. So some people can eat a bunch of red beets. Their urine will stay yellow in color. Other people will eat a bunch of red beets. And the next time they urinate, their urine will be the color of their shirt. Yeah. So it's really kind of cool. So what our kidney does is it takes stuff we want to get rid of and the secretion puts it in the urine so we can get rid of it. And then if you have a bad UTI, uh, there's one antibiotic that's really bright orange, and it gets transferred to your urine too. So if your urine comes out really bright orange, you can have that antibiotic. So the same process. Which is why we take <coughs> antibiotics every day by day. It would be great if we had one pill or one antibiotic and you have to take them every day. But the key to think about is we complex them. The, long, the more we complex the compound, the longer it stays in the blood. So there are some antibiotics you can take once a day. There's a couple of antibiotics we take once every three or four days. And then there are antibiotics we have to take them every 12 hours. Because those, those are being dumped by the kidney quickly. So we can't maintain blood levels of it. So we have to maintain blood levels by taking the pills of it. So, this is something you have to understand that your homework's going to drive you crazy and your celebration is going to be very crazy. And that is that anytime we use the word secretion, we're going from the lumen of the nephron back into the blood. These are things that we want to maintain. We do not want to lose. To make sense out of that for you, Glucose freely moves through the filter, through the filter. But in most people, you will not get ever any glucose in their urine because the tubule picks all the glucose up and returns it to your blood. If you're a diabetic and the glucose is not bound with insulin, the tubule cells don't recognize the glucose and you end up with glucose in your urine. It's the classic way that we do <coughs> a quick determination of whether somebody might actually have diabetes is whether their tubule cells can recognize glucose. Is that way to go for uh, uh -huh. maybe glucose Yes. So yours is gestational diabetes is being caused by the hormone shift created by the pregnancy. Did you mean to say reabsorption is when it goes from Glomerular the capsule into the blood? Because the way it's showing it in the picture is that way, when you said. This, okay, so this is filtration. Right. This is glomerular filtration occurring here. So if we have glucose here, we want to take it out of the tubule and put it in the blood, then that's reabsorption. Okay? So then secretion goes into. That is secretion. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You said that. So. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you say it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> so the red arrow from the tubule back to blood is reabsorption. And just color coding I love sometimes. So urea is yellow in color. So you secrete urea into your urine. So the yellow arrow is. So red is because it's going back into your blood. 
reabsorption. The yellow arrow is because it's going into your urine secretion. Okay. All right. So the nephron is divided into functional parts. So we have a renal corpuscle, which is where filtration occurs. Attached to the renal corpuscle, we have a tube that's highly folded, so we say it is convoluted. So why do we fold something? So we call it the proximal convoluted tube. Then we have this loop where the urine passes down into the medulla, and then comes back out of the medulla. So the urine is counter current in the way it travels. So this is called a loop of Henle. So when urine's going from the cortex toward the medulla, we say it's the descending layer. When urine's going from the end of the loop of Henle back up into the cortex, we say it is the ascending layer. And then what's critical about the ascending layer is the bottom part is lined with simple squamous cells. So we say it's thin, the thin ascending limb. So you have it thin above this. So you remember that. And then near the top, the, the epithelium converts from simple squamous to simple cuboid. So we call it thick ascending limb. Now it's going to be critical for our discussion. Not so much on the descending limb, but on the ascending. So we'll, we'll, we'll worry about thin ascending, thick ascending. When I say thin, you think squamous. When I say thick, you think cuboid. And those cells are good at different functions. Squamous cells are good at diffusion and osmosis. Cuboid cells are good at secretion and reabsorption. And then we go back into a coiled tube. So since it's coiled, we say it is <coughs> convoluted. But our reference point is the corpuscle. So since this one is next to the corpuscle, we say it's proximal. Since this one is further away from the corpuscle, we say it is distal. So the distal convoluted tubule. And then distal convoluted tubules lead into collecting ducts. And collecting ducts pass down through the the medulla again. Uh, and so collecting ducts pass down through our pyramid again. And then several collecting ducts come together and form a single duct. In this area we call the papilla. So they're called papillary ducts. So the end here is a papillary duct. Then a papillary duct drains the urine to a minor calyx. And then minor calyces lead to, major calyx leads to, renal pelvis, which leads to the urinary. Very good. All right. So now what we want to do is put <coughs> simplistic functions that then we're going to modify to more detailed functions. So filtration occurs in our renal corpus because of our glomerulus. The proximal convoluted tubule is largely responsible for reabsorption, which is going from where to where? Reabsorption. From the lumen of the tubule to the blood. So that's stuff we want to keep. <coughs> and then the loop of Henle is involved in further reabsorption. And one of the things we're really going to look at is movement of the water. Okay. And then when we get to the distal convoluted tubule, we're going to make a shift from primarily being involved in reabsorption to primarily being involved in secretion. So we're going to make a shift to secretion. And the collecting duct is going to do variable reabsorption. So what we have is kind of reabsorption, reabsorption, secretion, and reabsorption as overviews of what's going on. And as you know, nothing is that simplistic ever. So 
So everything's going to do both reabsorption and secretion. But it's whether it's mostly doing one or the other. Right? All right. So what we end up with is a filter that's, in, that's, a, that's an imperfect filter. And our filter is going to be comprised of three layers. And what we're going to do is we're going to take fluid from the blood and we're going to collect the fluid in a space outside the, the filter <coughs> called a capsular space. Okay. So the innermost layer of the filter is the glomerular endothelium. Then the next layer out of our filter is the glomerular basement membrane. And then the next layer out is, are some cool cells called photocytes. So we have three layers to the filter. Okay. Alright. So then, so then we have some things that we can use, like the word endothelium. So if I put EPI becomes epithelium. So the endothelium is a type of epithelium. Okay. Anytime we use the word endothelium, the word endo is telling us it is inside of something, right? So if we looked at our entire cardiovascular system, from our heart, which I'm not a good artist, to our arteries that are going away from the heart, to a capillary bed where we do exchange, and then to veins that carry blood back to our heart. And the entire cardiovascular system is lined with simple squamous epithelium. Okay. So if it's inside the heart, then we say it is endocardium. But if it's in the artery, the vein or a capillary bed, we say it is in the endothelium. So anytime we use the word endothelium, we're talking about a single layer of simple spinous epithelium. So now what's one of the tenets that we learned about epithelial tissue? Is all epithelial tissue sits on a Base membrane. So then the other thing <coughs> you have to remember is anytime we have epithelial tissue, so in this instance we've got these really flat cells that are creating a layer, then what organizes those cells into a layer is the underlying base membrane. So that what we end up with is this layer that underlies the epithelium, which is a basement membrane. Okay. And what's really cool in the kidney is we've got these cells that sit outside of them, which kind of have big cell bodies and nuclei. And then they've got these extensions, kind of like an octopus. So they've got these feet that extend off of it. So poda is a reference to foot. So podocyte is a foot cell. And so these foot cells sit on the outside. So fluid is going to move through these from into the lumen of the blood vessel to so the lumen of the glomerulus to the capsular space, or the space down So what we're going to do is move from the lumen of glomerulus into capsular space. And we're going to move through these three layers. So those three layers make up our filter. Let's look at that in a little more detail. So if we 
if we take them apart, all we would see is that when we look at our endothelium, which is the yellow, the cells don't actually sit next to each other like we typically think of. And there's no space between the cells. So that space is called a pore. Well, in biology, a simple word like pore can't ever work because it's too simple. So we have a high-tech <coughs> word for pores, which are fenestrations. So we end up with endothelial fenestrations. All right. What was the block again? A squamous cell, simple squamous cell. So, so we have these fenestrations or pore. And so what we don't want to do, because we make red blood cells at 2 million per second, and we have to have a bunch of red blood cells to keep our cells oxygenated, so we don't want to constantly lose red blood cells to grow urine. So one of the things clinically we always test for is the presence of blood in urine, because that tells us something's not right. So what happens is these pores are under 8 microns in diameter. And a red blood cell is 8 to 10 microns. So what the fenestrations do is prevent the loss of blood cells. Because it takes us a lot of energy to make blood cells. And we don't want to lose them. And we, if we were losing iron at that rate, we could never ingest enough iron to keep our cells healthy. In fact, what usually happens when people begin to have kidney failure and this filter begins to fail as they become anemic. And then you cannot get enough iron in them either with, with diet or drugs. So they actually have to end up going to where the most common place you'd see it in Spokane is Cancer Northwest where, where they manage cancer patients on chemotherapy. And they have to put IVs of iron in them. So they have to start an IV and they have to stay in there a couple hours while this iron is put in their body because you can't ingest enough if you're losing too much iron um, because of some process like kidney failure. So you have to do it through IVs to try to keep them from getting too immune. Right? So our little pore then forgets, prevents our cell from losing red blood cells, RBCs, and white blood cells. So one of the things we're going to test for tomorrow is the presence of both red and white blood cells. Because in a normal healthy person, we should have none of those. And when we get them, then we know that something's going on. Then we have a diagnostic tool. And then we have to think, okay, why, are we this, why am I getting this positive test? And then it's a process to go back and, and look at that. Okay. So now the next layer is our basement membrane. And if we go back to blood osmolarity, which was the relationship between our blood and, so this is our blood, this is the, <coughs> between our blood and our cells, this is our cells, and this is intracellular. Then we have proteins that are found inside cells, and they create an osmotic potential. We have proteins found in IF, they create an osmotic potential. So the only way we're going to create an isotonic situation is to have proteins inside our blood that we call plasma proteins. And they help us maintain blood osmolarity or an isotonic environment. So do we want to lose all those blood proteins in our urine all the time? No, because then we have trouble maintaining blood osmolarity. So what the basal lamina, which is a subdivision some part of the, uh, the basement membrane. So just by basement membrane by basal lamina, and that'll remind you that the basal lamina is uh, one of the layers of the basement membrane. Then it prevents large proteins from occurring. So the most common one is the same protein you get in egg whites, which is a protein called albumin. That's the most common blood plasma protein we have to help us maintain osmotic potential as well which I always thought was pretty clever when you think about 
how one extracts resources from the world around them to keep their own resources going. Why eggs? <laughs> you don't absorb it. The same, you don't absorb it as the entire protein. But you break it down, all the amino acids you need to make, you need to make new albumin or albumin. Yeah, so it's kind of cool. All right. And in the, the little foot cells, so here's a foot of size, they have the little feet, and the feet are called pedicels. So ped is another name for <coughs> foot. So we have photocytes with pedicels, feet with feet, feet cells with feet. Then there's a membrane that extends between the little feet, so it's kind of like the webbing in a frog's toes, the membrane between the toes. <coughs> and that's called a slit membrane. <coughs> Excuse me. And slit membranes limit the loss of meat <coughs> protein. So in other words, we have a filter that limits the loss of blood cells, large proteins, and medium proteins. Anything else in your medium proteins. Anything else in your blood goes through. That's why we have a proximal convoluted tubule, a leukohemolate, and a distal convoluted tubule that are going to help us process that, okay? Because we, we got a bunch of stuff we got to retain that we just let out. Every free amino acid in your blood is going to exit. Sugar is going to exit, but we, we don't want to lose all that. So we have to have reabsorption occur because we have an imperfect filter. All right, so I'm running out of time here. So we're going to talk about the, the filtration rate, how that works. We're going to talk about hormones and control. <coughs> uh, and so we're going to talk about all this. It's really cool. It'd be cool if you read it a little bit before you come to class. Because <laughs> then it'll be like, oh, this makes sense. It's good. Oh, yeah.